Hi, welcome to a special edition of The Point. I'm Chris Ryan, the guest host. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, which go together perfectly, like chips, salsa, and cold beer. Or if you're a fancy European, maybe wine, stinky cheese, and a crusty baguette. You get the idea. Um, quick aside, sex, drugs, and rock and roll is a little bit redundant. You might not know this, but rock and roll originally meant to fuck. Uh, so it's really sex, drugs, and fucking. So think about that next time uh, you hear rock around the clock or uh, the fact, I, I just heard on the way over here, that the slogan of the Olympics this year is rock the games. So this week we've got three, three great points. The first is from Dr. Julie Holland, a psychiatrist in New York, who I met in 1999 at an ecstasy conference at the Dead Sea Hyatt in Israel. True story. Uh, Julie's a physician, board certified psychiatrist, also one of the nation's foremost experts on drugs and drug research, as well as the author of Ecstasy, A Complete Guide. Uh, the second point comes from Harry Shapiro, author of Waiting for the Man, The Story of Drugs and Popular Music. He's going to be talking about whether musicians' drug use inspires their teenage fans to experiment with drugs themselves, or whether that's a red herring. And then for our final point, we're going to be talking about drugs and sex specifically, and uh, focusing on whether drugs uh, can enhance sexual gratification. We know there are drugs, uh, boner pills, but we want to look at beyond that. We want to look at whether or not drugs can actually enhance the pleasure and the intimacy of sex, and if so, whether that's a bad thing necessarily. Um, but before we get into that, I want to introduce our stellar panel. Uh, first, we've got Hugo Switzer here, a history and gender studies professor at Pasadena City College, as well as a columnist for Jezebel, and the co-author of Beauty Disrupted, the biography of famed, or is it autobiography? It says autobiography, but if you're the author. Well, it's, it's I am the collaborator on a memoir. There you go. All right, so memoir it is, is sort of an autobiography term, yeah. of, yes, of Carrie absolutely. Otis, the famous fashion model from the 80s, right? 80s and early 90s. 80s and 90s, okay. Uh, in addition, we've got Richard Metzger, an old pal of mine, former host of the British television show Disinformation as well as a book publisher, DV and film, DVD and film distributor, and blogger at DangerousMinds.net, which I highly recommend. Both uh, the website and the Twitter feed is a constant stream of mind-blowing, interesting stuff. I, I'm a big fan. Thank you. Uh, and Cara, Cara Santa Maria, <laughs> whose name I always want to pronounce with the Spanish accent, which Why is not? wrong because we are not in Spain or Mexico. <laughs> Uh, anyway, Kara is a science correspondent, senior science correspondent for the Huffington Post, host of Talk Nerdy to Me podcast, and also a former guest host of this show. So welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. So uh, before we go any further, let's take a look at our first point, uh, Julie Holland's uh, point, and uh, then we'll come back and talk about it. Hi, this is Dr. Julie Holland. I am a psychiatrist in New York City and I'm a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at the NYU School of Medicine. Uh, my point today is that there are several drugs that are listed in Schedule 1, which makes them illegal, but really have tremendous uh, therapeutic potential and deserve to be studied and potentially prescribed for patients, and that means they need to be rescheduled. Uh, three in particular, um, psilocybin, which can be useful as an adjunct in psychotherapy to help sort of uh, create a mystical experience, which can be very useful for dealing with end-of-life issues. And there's several studies uh, with psilocybin and cancer patients going on right now across the country at NYU and Johns Hopkins, and there was one at UCLA. And then there's MDMA, better known as ecstasy. Um, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is proving very useful for treating post-traumatic stress disorder and as many of you know we've got a lot of veterans now returning from the Afghan and Iraq wars with pretty significant post-traumatic stress disorder and it would be nice to give them a quick easy way to feel better. Um, and then there's cannabis which is an ancient medicinal plant um, and just because you make something illegal doesn't mean that you magically strip it of its therapeutic properties. I mean, cannabis has been used for millennia to treat anything ranging from insomnia to menstrual cramps to nausea and loss of appetite associated with cancer and chemotherapy. Um, I have edited uh, two books which are nonprofit projects where all the proceeds are funding clinical research. And the first one is, is on MDMA. It's called Ecstasy, the Complete Guide. 
you could see it here. And that came out in 2001. And then my other nonprofit project is called The Pot Book. Uh, and this is a complete guide to cannabis that came out in 2010, I believe. Uh, you can learn more by going to thepotbook.com or uh, drholland.com. And uh, I thank you for your time and your attention. All right, so that's Julie. Uh, interestingly, I, I mentioned that I met her at this ecstasy conference in Israel. And the reason the conference was held in Israel is the Israeli military sponsored the conference. And it's brought together everyone in the world who was doing significant research on MDMA, also known as ecstasy, uh, including the guy who invented it, um, Sasha Shulgin, who lives in Berkeley. Um, and the reason the Israeli military sponsored the conference is that they were very interested in using MDMA in treating post-traumatic stress disorder among their soldiers. So this is something they were, you know, 10 years ago they were looking at seriously. I've got suspicions that they may also have been interested in using it in interrogations. Mm. Which brings Makes up sense. a whole different yeah. set of, you know, ethical considerations. You know, would you rather have your fingernails pulled out or get high on MDMA and have, you know, a sexy interrogator ask you questions. <laughs> but that's another show. Uh, so what do you guys think about uh, the use of illegal drugs, uh, Hugo specifically, what, what do you think about this? Are we ready for this as a culture or is this raise too many problems? Oh, I, th I think we're definitely ready for it as a culture, but, you know, one of the things that um, uh, Dr. Holland said, it, she described it as the need to create um, an environment where we could give people who are suffering a quick and easy way to feel better. Right. And when you've got some kind of therapeutic oversight, fabulous. I have no problem, I don't think anyone has any problem, I don't think anyone here would have a problem with these drugs being administered in a therapeutic context where there is some kind of a follow-up. The problem is that's extraordinarily expensive. It's a, it immediately creates a gateway, uh, or sorry, not a gateway, it creates an obstacle uh, to ordinary citizens being able to access this. It creates um, all kinds of ethical issues about, you know, what kind of oversight? You know, we already have a huge problem in this country with the insurance companies encouraging psychiatrists to write prescriptions but not right. actually do talk therapy, right. which is what does good work. If all we're doing is putting more drugs on the market but not following up with talk therapy, I'm not sure that's a really effective solution. Well, People can already get their hands on these drugs, so I'm not really, I don't really understand that argument. So you think that if they are available in a pharmacy, it's going to be easier for people to get their hands on illicit, well, they would no longer be illicit drugs, but on these drugs to be able to abuse them? Well, I think that if, if we declare that these drugs are therapeutic, mm -hmm. which they currently we are not stating as a nation, as, as a people that these are therapeutic, we're just stating that they're recreational. If we give them sort of the, the imprimatur of being an effective therapeutic device, but then don't back that up with actual therapy, I think we could be misleading people. If we just want to make them available, legalize them as for recreational purposes, no problem. Yeah, that's never going to happen. But, yeah, right. <laughs> no. but, but I mean, but, well, but this, seem, this sounds like a broader argument, like uh, kind of against uh, antidepressants or anxiolytics as it stands. Mm. Because, I mean, we're functioning in a society now where most psychiatrists don't offer talk therapy. A lot of psychologists do, and psychiatrists will recommend talk therapy. Insurance I mean, I have. Insurance doesn't pay for it. My insurance does. I have a psychiatrist and How a psychologist. Many I have what's called parity. I, I deal with major depressive disorder, and that's an ongoing disorder. Yeah. So my insurance covers every session. Oh, nice. Yeah. nice. I think that's unusual, though. Well, parity, parity disorders are different than, right. than regularly. So, so if somebody's dealing with kind of a, um, an adjustment disorder, for example, the insurance company will offer generally 10 to 15 sessions because they think that that's going to be enough yeah. to work through whatever the adjustment problem is. Yeah. It, obviously, um, psychologists can kind of apply to the insurance company to extend it, but anybody right. who deals with parity, bipolar, schizophrenia, right. depression, uh, anorexia, like any of these um, disorders that are ongoing life challenges, yeah. if they have insurance, it should be covered by Let their insurance Let me challenge policy. one thing you said, though. Uh, you said people can already get their hands on these drugs. Sure. Not in the case of MDMA. When I, you go to a club and you buy MDMA, the odds are very, very high that you are not getting MDMA. That's true. You might not be getting any MDMA, because what's cut in and sold is MDMA. 
and in this country it's illegal to do testing. In Europe, where I, where I live in Spain, there are labs set up, you can send in a sample, they'll send you back a report saying what percentage of this is MDMA, and if they, if they know, they'll tell you what the, the filler is as well. So, because some of that stuff's very dangerous. Methamphetamines and other stuff can be Well, but MDMA it. is methylene dioxymethamphetamine. I right. mean, it, it, but that's not what you buy at a rave. That's true, but That's but what even they say they're selling you. When it's cannabis, you can see what it yes. is. So there, there are differences in different types of drugs, is what I'm saying. Because so some are very dangerous. Yeah, you're probably you not going to buy you're not going to go to a rave and buy drugs for a therapeutic experience. Exactly. You, you know what I'm saying? You're not going to self-medicate in that you, way with that kind of music. But if you want kind of them for that experience, that might be the only place you're going to be able to get them well, in the current state of Except affairs. with your, your friends in the Israeli army. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, Approach right, right to the Israeli army and ask them for their supply. Whenever you, I've, whenever I've got a buddy in Spain, actually, who was at that same conference. He did his PhD research on psychotherapy uh, with women who had been sexually abused and hadn't responded to any other... A clinical protocol and he was doing MDA assisted psychotherapy with them and had fantastic results mm -hmm. because what MDMA does for for viewers who may not know the main uh, effect of MDMA is it creates a sense of compassion and bonding and it reduces the fear and anxiety around whatever you're, you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're in therapy, generally you're trying to take control of an experience by reliving it or re-experiencing it on your own terms. So if you can eliminate the fear and anxiety around that, it's much more effective. Also, it's, I mean, it's interesting, MDMA was used for over a decade uh, therapeutically. It, I think it was before just it Schedule illegal. 1 in like the 80s. Am I wrong? When like it, it was in Austin, it sort of filtered into the club scene mm -hmm. and then it became an issue, but yeah, it was invented in the early 70s, I think. Oh, well, there you, you go. Yeah, 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 it was used in psychiatry up until. Well, in yeah. Texas, you could actually buy it at bars. You could really? buy it over the counter at in bars. Texas? It was, yeah, it was, it was one, of the, last, it was one yeah. of the last states to actually schedule it. Yeah, wow. and, and uh, while we're talking about history, LSD. I mean, you guys probably know this, but LSD was initially sold as what was called a psychotomimetic. It was initially sold for about 15, 20 years before it became illegal in the early 60s to psychiatrists mm -hmm. so that they could take it and experience psychosis as a way to better understand their patients. Mm -hmm. Imagine how, I mean, to me that's a beautiful thing, that a doctor mm -hmm. would take a drug to induce a temporary state of psychosis as a way to bond more closely with their patients and understand what they're going through. Hmm. It's almost a shamanic thing, you know? Well, well, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, I have, I'm not somebody who's ever sought out any kind of therapy in my life, but several times I've sought out psychedelics to change my mind, right? right? And I found it incredibly beneficial. You know, it's, it's, it's and, and I think people can do that on their own. They're not not yeah. everybody's going to be lucky enough to know someone like Julie Holland, right. where they could go through that experience, but right. they can do it themselves, and they're going to get some benefit from it. I'm living well, really proof of that. It, if they're lucky, if they're smart, right. but unfortunately, a lot of people take psychedelics and they go to a party or a concert well, or a it, bar, well, it presupposes which is the Chris, worst place to I know go. that's true, but I'm, it presupposes that you're going into the experience right. with some vision quest or, you know, yeah. in the other cultures where it's like a rite of passage. For well, them. that's every other culture that's had access to hallucinogenic plants mm -hmm. has seen them as the greatest gift of the gods, right? Except us where you go to prison for a longer sentence under minimum mandatory sentencing guidelines for getting caught with 100 hits of acid in your pocket or a certain amount of mushrooms than second degree murder, mm -hmm. right? What does that say about our society? What are we, what do hallucinogens particularly have that inspires such fear in well, our society? They can change your mind. It's not about the hallucinogens. That's not, it's, not, it's not because of the effects on people that they're scheduled that way. Obviously, I am not a fan of the drug war at all, but this legislation, let's be honest, is about the things that come along with the drug trade. It's about the violence. But and see, the, okay, there's the no violence associated with, with LSD, though. No, 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 or I'm talking magic about people mushroom. who sell LSD. They're not killing people. It's the cocaine yeah, trade that's killing people. Yeah. And the that's methamphetamine. true, but all of that's these things are That's why when we talk together, about drugs, yeah, this you're is right. difficulty we with can't the scheduling lump them system. Together. It's like yeah. lumping together cannabis as a schedule I mean this is the real problem does it have a therapeutic purpose at all yeah. yes yeah it shouldn't be schedule one right exactly it shouldn't and it clearly does I mean there's a whole history demonstrating that it is. cannabis is apparently the the plant that has the longest history of cultivation by human beings right yeah mm -hmm. and you can talk well, well you know what, what it's interesting last point go well, ahead. okay go ahead do you know how apparently how cannabis use you know you could use it to get high or with some like 
they were uh, they were making uh, nets for right, fishing, right. right? A long time ago, right. millions of years ago, out of hemp, and they would notice that the fish would pass out in the water. Really? And then they, you know, may have taken them another two hundred years to put two and two together, but how do we know that? But the fossil records. Hmm, fossil records of, of fish, fish of yeah. stone fish. Well, there's, but they, 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 <laughs> the they, scientist in me is I'm calling not bullshit not sure, on that. One. No, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna look this a, up when I get home. There's a new book. There's a new book coming out. Hmm. Mark Merlin. I can't think of his co-author, but I'm telling you, it's in the book. It'll All be published right. in the next year. All right, anyway. beautiful. Well, on that beautiful image of stone fish and prehistoric yeah. nets, <laughs> uh, we're going to cut away to a commercial, and we'll be back with another fascinating point. Welcome back. Our next video comes from author Harry Shapiro of Drugscope in Great Britain. He'll be talking about whether our kids are becoming potheads because they listen to Lil Wayne. Is that how you pronounce that? Lil Wayne? I don't even know. I'm so old, I don't even know who the hell Lil Wayne is. Uh, let's watch his video and then we'll come back and talk about it. Hi, my name's Harry Shapiro. I'm, I'm the author of this book, Waiting for the Man, the story of drugs and popular music which is, uh, sets the whole scene really for the relationship between these two powerful drivers of popular culture, drugs and music. covers the whole landscape. But I make a particular uh, emphasis in the book on this question of the degree to which uh, what rock stars do, their lifestyles, the songs they write, uh, influence young people in relationship to taking drugs. And my point is that there is very little evidence that what young rock stars get up to in terms of their um, excesses, shall we say, actually impacts on young people in terms of lifestyle and in particular drug choices. So for example, um, many a young uh, music fan might aspire to play guitar like Jimi Hendrix or sing like Amy Winehouse. Um, but by and large, they regard their deaths as really a tragic waste of talent. My point is that I really don't think there's any evidence and that by and large, the choices that young people make about drug use is much more to do with their own personal and social circumstances. Bearing in mind that rock stars are as remote for young people as politicians and Wall Street bankers. I work for a UK drugs charity called Drugscope. And if you go to www.drugscope.org.uk, you'll see the work we do, and maybe you, or maybe the company you work for, can help us in our work. Thank you very much. Richard, what's your take on this? What do you think? Uh, I agree with what he's saying. You think kids aren't influenced in no, that respect? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I'm 46, and I will admit that when I was younger, I thought drugs I thought drugs were glamorous because I was really into William Burroughs and Lenny Bruce and stuff like that. So we emulate writers, not well, musicians. Well, no, I'm just saying that in my case, I can't deny that that was an influence on me. Right. But you look at it today, I don't think so. Um, if anything, if, 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 if there was a pop star who was glamorizing drug use, there is in the culture today, in the media today, the antidote, which is a show like Intervention. Which, who would watch a show like that and think, oh, I'm gonna, I want to be like that guy with no teeth. It doesn't make any sense. It's huge. It's my, my wife's watched every episode, I'm telling you. Is she 14? No. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's 17, which is legal. <laughs> Just is barely. Just barely. Just barely. No. Certain oh. states. Certain <laughs> states. <laughs> she doesn't live in California. All right. Yeah, so. Anyway, enough about your wife. Mm. Uh, so you think that kids, you know, see, I'm, I'm I not I, sure I, I'm about not sure this. I'm not sure I agree with it because yeah, I think it's, think? It, this is such a gray thing. We'd love to go, oh, wrong or right, but yeah. I think there's a lot in the middle. Uh, yeah. And Harry Shapiro is talking about how everybody looked at Amy Winehouse and then they say, oh, it's so tragic that she died. Right. Well, yeah, because she fucking died. Mm -hmm. What about the rock stars that are like partying and having a really Fleetwood good time? Mac. Yeah, yeah. Man, your references are. <laughs> 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 I think even, even young people know about Keith Richards and his extraordinary longevity. Which, yeah. You know, and, and, yeah. You know, and the message that that sends that, in fact, you can do an incredible amount of drugs and survive. Yeah. Uh, which is often a very misleading message. As long as you don't look play like the drum. Age, right. but, uh, <laughs> I think the drum, you know, the, the guy explodes in a spinal tap. Yeah, yeah. Watch out yeah. For that. Uh, yeah I, I'm not so sure. I, I think that, I, I agree that it depends on the kid, right? And if the kid's got artistic aspirations, mm -hmm. 
then I think he or she is probably already looking to push boundaries. Mm -hmm. And pushing consciousness-related boundaries is sort of the obvious mm -hmm. way to go if you're a musician or a painter or a writer or whatever, you know? <laughs> and so you, you, especially at that age, you're sort of idolizing people who really went out there. You know? Well, in the, in the Naked Lunch, there used to be an index, the original edition of the book, and it was all of these different kinds of, you know, like a, sort of like a pharmacopoeia that you might be able to get your hands on. And, right. and so I, as like an 11-year-old, am like trying to like eat as much nutmeg as I possibly can <laughs> to try to get high, because I had read that, right? And it just makes you puke, and it has to be fresh. <laughs> but, or I would like, you know, I'd roll up oregano yeah. with like a yeah. brown paper bag and smoke it. Oh Did you I, spin around <laughs> until you fell down? I didn't do, no, kid? I didn't do Did that. I went, smoked oregano. Like when you were five. No, no. Nit no nitrous from a whipped cream oh, can? Whip it. Oh, whip Oh, yeah. yeah. Been, whip there, been there, done that, yeah. yeah. I used to do it in gro a grocery store. I would just walk up, put I it mean, down. The yeah. thing is, walking. I think certain types of kids are going to want to do drugs. Yeah. And uh, there's a fine line in culture if we're trying to prevent kids from doing drugs where promoting drug use is not a good idea, but also restricting drug use and, and saying how horrible, horrible, horrible it is, it just makes you want to push the big red button. And so uh, there yeah. are some kids who will never want to do drugs and there's yeah. some kids who will want to do drugs. And I know for me, when I did drugs, because I did you know, my fair share through high school and college, I could do them. I was resilient and I was somewhat, I mean, I tried to be safe in my drug use and I never did highly addictive drugs. Right. Um, but as an adult, I don't do drugs anymore because I can't, because it's not fun for me, and I don't like to have to recover after. And, you know, it, they hit me harder than they used to, but when I was a kid, I could also skateboard. Well, I couldn't skateboard, but I, I could try to skateboard, and if I fell on my head, it didn't really hurt as bad, you know mm. what I mean? And so I think that it, it, there's an excitement that comes along with expanding. It, it's not so heavy. It's not yeah. this like religious experience. Yeah. It's not a, you know, understanding of the greater consciousness. You may think it is at the time, but really you're just trying to have fun with your friends. If I can just pick yeah. up on, on, on Kara's point, because I think there is a really important distinction between those kids who are, you know, in a sense normal and well-adjusted, even if they are, if I can use that term for you, even uh, <laughs> normal and well-adjusted. She used to be, exactly. as a kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, or at least uh, better, as you said, resilient. Sure. You know, I, I'm a sober alcoholic. I've got 14 years sober. Um, the first time I drank when I was 13, I was hooked. Uh, and I never used drugs recreationally. I always used them addictively, primarily, you know, very, very basic stuff, alcohol and cocaine. And for me, music was a way of justifying and enhancing the experience that was very destructive and addictive. You know, for example, um, right before I got sober, uh, the album that I played over and over again, Alice in Chains' EP, Jar of Flies. Uh, and there's a song right on the end of it, Don't Follow, which is just sort of this, you know, one of those classic and very, you know, predictive for what would happen to Lane Staley. Uh, one of those songs about a guy just slipping down, farther down, don't follow me, I'm, I'm gonna die. Yeah. And I would drink and drink and pound, you know, alcohol by myself and listen to that song on auto repeat. And his voice, certainly for me, because I was already an alcoholic, that was an enormously, um, what I would say, is reinforcing experience for my addiction. But that's because I, it didn't make me an alcoholic. Right. It yeah. reinforced for me and legitimized some of my self-destructive behavior. For somebody who was Even more resilient. Even the message was really the opposite. The message yeah, was but, don't but do it, what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, but, right? it, but the me whenever you send a message, don't do this, to someone who has an adolescent addictive mindset, right. the real thing is, no, do this. Yeah. Uh, because there is such a romance with right. self-destruction. There's such right. a romance with addiction. There's such a romance with dying young and leaving a good-looking corpse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. there's a lot, for, for the teen who has the, the predilection for that, bam. Yeah, That's true. And, and, and all teens do to some extent, especially boys, because yeah. their brains just aren't developed. <laughs> but this idea I mean. of, you know, somebody <laughs> no, the, the, who... Seriously, right? Well, biologically. Biologically, our frontal cortices aren't developed until we're in our mid-20s. So right. even though I'm... And I'm Please understand, I'm not advocating that young children do drugs. I'm talking about my experience yeah. with drugs and how yeah. it affected me. And, and it probably wasn't, you know, there's a risk-benefit analysis there, which I was not old enough to make. And looking mm -hmm. back, there are things that I definitely regret, and there are things that I learned from. But being a young person who doesn't have a developed frontal cortex, because that's not really getting to be somewhat fixed. I mean, we all know that the brain is not fixed, even in adulthood, but it doesn't even get to be somewhat fixed until you're in your mid 20s. 
Yeah. It's a long yeah. time to be developing the skills to yeah. choose. I, I, I often think, you know, if when we have children, like, you know, I have to be honest about my experiences because I'm, I'm a kind of a definitive study of one. I mean, I've really tried just about <laughs> everything. I'm, right. I'm lucky I'm sitting here, to be honest. But, but I would have to give that, I mean, I would have to come clean with my kids and say, look, this is what it is. And, this is what you should probably stay away from. This right. is what's probably safe. And if you stay in that direction, you're, you're going to be okay. But don't go yeah. there well, because know, I could have died, and I'm yeah, lucky that I did it. I hear you. And I hear you, you know. man. I, I, you know, in, in Dutch, there's an expression that translates to uh, you must tolerate to control. Mm. I can't say it in Dutch. I'd spit all over the table probably. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I wonder about that because in Holland, you know, looking at sexuality, for example, in Holland, if... Uh, a uh, 14, 15 year old girl brings her boyfriend over for dinner and the parents like the kid, he's welcome to spend the night, typically, in her room, right? right? And they'll have breakfast together. And you now, American parents might look at that and say, oh my God, are you kidding me? Never in a million years. But you think your 14 year old daughter isn't out fucking in the car? You know? Well, some of them aren't. Some of so them not, aren't. Not all some 14 year old aren't. daughters are out fucking all in right, cars. All right, all right, all right, yes. I wasn't. I'm not not when I was 14. No. <laughs> a few of them. Were. A few of them Just definitely like the ones. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, the point is that what's going to happen is going to happen in sex mm -hmm. and drugs, whatever. So in Holland, you've got teen pregnancy rates that are like a third of what they are in Mississippi, Alabama, places like that, right? That don't have any sex ed and any yeah. tolerance for things. Well, STD, you know. You hit it on. You hit yeah. the. You hit the nail on the head when you said that. That don't have sex ed. The issue with the way that we approach drug policy, the issue that we with the way that we approach like the D.A.R.E. program in schools right. is we don't educate children about what drugs are, what they do, what their therapeutic benefits may be, what they'll do if you become addicted. We, we throw around terms like, you know, all drugs are bad and, and marijuana, you've seen those, you know, sensible drug policy PSAs or whatever where the kid's right. like smoking pot and then he like, I don't know, his brain murders is his frying. brother. There's some oh, sort of horrible. Reef for madness. So. I mean, and, and, and that's the problem. This isn't, yeah. this isn't solid evidence-based yeah. education, and it's just fear-mongering. Yeah. And, and when you do that, then kids aren't going to trust the authority figures that are actually trying exactly. to look out for them. Because they don't do what Richard's saying, which is come clean. Just come now, clean. But then you've got Obama in his autobiography saying, yeah, I smoked some reefer, snorted a little blow. Meanwhile, he's still supporting the policies that have hundreds of thousands of people in prison for doing nothing same, more than well, what he did. he did. He yeah, has exactly. To. Do you think that if he came out for decriminalizing marijuana that he would get reelected? Yes. No I do. fucking but way. You know would why? Obama get you reelected? He's not going to try it. I agree. No, he's not going to try it. I think that that and I'm no expert on this, okay? But look at the Clinton impeachment situation. Okay, mm -hmm. the Republicans said, you know, we're going to bring him down. We caught him getting a blowjob, this whole situation. We're going to bring him down. We're going to impeach him. What happened to his numbers while they were impeaching him? His numbers were going up. The American public, look at the, the huge swing in acceptance of uh, same-sex marriage. In the last 10 years, the swing has been more than 10%. I think the American public is way ahead of the political culture, what, people, what, people that you know are. But look what happened in California. I, I, don't think so. I mean, yeah. uh, look what happened with Prop 8 in California. I mean, look at these things that are happening all over the country. Mormonism, that's what happened to <laughs> Prop that's 8. That's true, exactly. but you that's know what? I mean, I don't know. It's like we have a. I think, Clinton was I think the country's the more Tea ready Party. for, free, for mm. legal grasp than they are for a Mormon president. That's what I think. That may be true. We're going to find that out very soon. Well, well, well I, the, the, the Mormon party, anyway. Yeah. But yeah. I think that the country, maybe with the left, getting to be, I shouldn't say the left is getting more progressive, but with more people maybe having a pro progressive view about a lot of these social issues, right. we're also seeing a harder fight on the right. I mean, the right has moved into the mental institution. I mean, yeah. it's, it's no yeah. longer the rational Republican Party. It's the fucking Tea Party. Right. And, and there's no way, even if Obama tried to push this but legislation the through, that, the, are, that Congress would let him push this but legislation through. But aren't the Tea through. Party largely libertarian? No, they don't. No. Uh, there's a, they, they've completely gone in. There's a new book about their, their fusion with the evangelicals. They're, they're, evangelicals. they're, they're, they're calling them tea evangelicals. Uh, I thought they were. I, wasn't the origin libertarian? Maybe. Yes, but it's. Oh, okay. can I no, really right. quickly, yeah, I want to yeah. return to the drug issue. Yeah, last point. Uh, right. um, and I think it's a point we've all been making, and uh, from my experience and, and everyone's experience here. As with sex, so too with drugs. Some 16 year olds are ready to have sex. Emotionally, physically, right. every, every, in every way ready. Others are not. Right. 
some 16-year-olds are ready to do drugs, inc including perhaps hard drugs, and, and have it be a life-enhancing experience. I was ready to have sex as a teenager. I was not ready to drink because I was an alcoholic. I am an alcoholic. Uh, you know, for me, I don't believe I can ever take a drink again. Uh, but that doesn't, my experience shouldn't be the foundation of public policy. Intelligent policy about both sex and drugs needs to take into account that kids and adults are different and we need to be able to cope with issues like addiction while at the same time allowing for the possibility that recreational sex in adolescence and recreational drug use over a lifespan can be really life enhancing for some people. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here, here. <laughs> All right. On that very excellent, well put point, we're going to take a break and we'll come back and talk about our next segment. Thanks. All right, our last segment uh, is gonna be about sex and drugs. Big surprise, not like we haven't been talking about it already, but this is a slightly different take on the, the question. Let's look at the video and we'll come back and chat about it. Sometimes you need a little help staying in the game. Ask your doctor about new Levitra. But once you get in the zone, it's good. Ask your doctor if the new choice is right for you. Ask about new Levitra. <laughs> All right, well, I had no idea that Levitra helped you throw a football better. Have a uh, cigar. Right. You have a cigar, <laughs> exactly. I don't think that they were talking about football. No, no, okay, well, <laughs> Kara. This one's your question. Great. So uh, what do you think? Is there something sort of inherently immoral or unethical? How do you prefer your your My boner sex? pills? Yeah. Oh. Uh, um, drug yeah. enhanced, <laughs> non-enhanced? How do I prefer my sex, drug yeah. enhanced or non-enhanced? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing that I don't like is that my antidepressants make it kind of ah, hard to cut. That's an interesting <laughs> so, angle. Yeah. So th yeah. my drugs don't really enhance my sex. Um, right. I know we were talking before the show about Sex on acid, sex on MDMA, and that's insane to really? me. I don't know how people could have sex on these super hard drugs. When I look right. back at when right. I used to take these drugs, the idea of, and I say used to, when I took them, the, the handful of times that I took them, sex was just so, like this insurmountable, intense thing that I wouldn't even want to attempt. I'd rather just kind right. of sit in a chair and like look at my hand. A exactly. Or like yeah. I don't want to have sex right. on X. Like right. this feels really good when you're on X. Right. You don't need to have right. an orgasm. But you know, boner pills. I'm I'm okay with it. But here's a question I have. I, I don't know if any of us here can answer it. But do these drugs like Levitra and, and the others? Do they? Do anything at all for desire, or do they just they're put a, a splint? They're on a your splint. Dick? That's exactly what I was going to say. They're a splint. But, I tried but, them; they're not that great. I don't. But some men who them. need them in order to get an erection, right? Okay. are probably going to experience more desire once they start feeling good about themselves that they can have sex with their wives again. All right, but my question is: is is the erectile dysfunction to some extent a result of culturally enforced monogamy? <laughs> I think for a lot Which of Which leads me to, <laughs> I am the author Whoa. of Sex at Dawn, The Prehistoric Origins of Modern Sexuality, which is all about how monogamy is not natural. So when I see something like this, I think like, of course they're not getting a hard on. They've been married to the same woman for 20 years. Nothing at all against that woman. That's the problem. Every man will tell you it's like, Subtle. you know. Subtle, Chris. <laughs> it's called the Coolidge effect in, in, in biology. Well, can I just say that? Yeah, when, when jump I, in here, please. Yeah, save me. When save I, me. Well, uh, when I was in college and when I was going in my promiscuous days, my problems getting an erection tended to happen when I was hooking up with somebody new that I wanted to impress. Ah, Whereas when okay. I was in a long-term relationship, I didn't have the problem. How uh, long-term were they when you long were Long-term, like you've been, you've been, well, you know, a couple months. <laughs> the 90-day wonders. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, 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 All right. it, and I would also term. say, you know, the other thing about, you know, it, we, always just, we always talk about needing this in order to have sex. Surely we all know that there's more to having sex than, than intercourse. Here, here. And one of the things about not being able to get an erection is that you can either sulk about it and you know go get ice cream, or you can do something else using your hands, using your mouth, using other things. And the more we medicalize the problem of not being able to get an erection, 
the more we center on one kind That's of sex. That's a great point. Yeah. That, you yeah. know, in many ways, maybe guys are not supposed to have hard-ons all the time, but they're still supposed to have amazing sex with women. Right. You know, not that women don't like intercourse too, but there needs to be something more. And this is yeah. Mother Nature's way of saying, dude, Use yeah. something else. Yeah, exactly. Spread it out a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So to speak. And women have similar problems as they get older, but you don't see the market flooded with drugs to help women. Ah, right. but the pharmaceutical companies are dying to come up with a female Viagra pill, you know, or Levitra or whatever it is. And they can't figure it out. Why? It's a very interesting well, thing. Well, have to increase desire. That's yeah, the point. That's, the, girl, that's the difficulty. Female and yeah. female sexual desire is so complex and has so little really to do with genital blood, blood flow. flow than, yeah. Which is yeah. why I kind of wonder if what you're saying about you know guys needing boner pills because they're just not into having sex with their wives anymore, that may be a small proportion of people for whom these drugs are overprescribed. But I think a fair amount of men who need these drugs need these drugs because of medical reasons. You know, because of their diet because of the things that yeah. have caused them to have mm -hmm. poor circulation. Right, which is also a, uh, an aspect of diabetes and uh, yeah, the rest of it. But there are also tools that aren't medical in nature. I mean, they are medical in nature, but they're not pharmaceutical in nature. You know, they're yeah. like cock rings and they're all sorts of apparatus. Yeah. yeah, there are things that work. I've got one. one yes. Oh, God. Remember, remember <laughs> the, oh, this is a glass table. I shouldn't do that. You gestured downwards. That was odd. Uh, this is well, really yeah, fun being be, the only female. Because on when, you, when you mentioned <laughs> penis pumps, I, I just read recently about a judge in Kansas or somewhere that was using a penis pump on the bench. Why? God, no, ask him. He's in jail now. He was just really bored. And, and the lawyers kept hearing this weird, like, whistling, sucking sound. <laughs> and I, I guess he was under there, like, squeezing the thing. Anyway. Uh, this is taking a turn for the yeah, story. Yeah, let's, let's bring it back. <laughs> now, here's a question, a very serious question, uh, that, that rarely gets brought up, I think, when we talk about drugs, uh, which I will be talking about in my next book, Civilized to Death, it's going to be called, I believe. And the question is, why do people take drugs, right? Now, you mentioned, I think it was during the break, that you grew up in West, West Virginia, mm -hmm. and there was nothing to do but take drugs, right? And, you know, I think... I think there's an aspect that we rarely look at, which is I think a lot of people take drugs because our society is so fucking depressing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, it's an escape. It's a way to get out. It's a way to, you know, it's like why we drink so much coffee if we work in a cubicle all day. Yeah. Just to stay awake, you yeah. know, just to make life tolerable. So I think a lot of drugs are a response to a pathological social system that we live in. People ask me all the time how, you know, I don't, I, I did drugs, I experimented with a lot of drugs, and I don't do drugs at all anymore, and I also don't drink, I never have. And, and so I'm always sober. From the morning I wake up to the time I go to sleep, every day of my life I'm sober. And people ask me all the time, how do you do it? How are you just always sober? And you know what, it's really exhausting. Mm -hmm. But you dream. I dream. You enter altered states in other ways. You I know, do. you probably do yoga, you work out, you dance. I dance. You dance. I dance. And <laughs> you dance. I mean, interestingly, dance. All right, in Africa, where there are very few uh, hallucinogenic, mind altering drugs available, uh, native to Africa, mm -hmm. they developed all these complex rhythms. And people dance and use rhythm as a way to enter trance, where they go into altered states of consciousness, obviously. In the Americas, where there's a plethora of mind-altering uh, substances, the music was very simple, right? Dum, 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 dum. But they're taking the drugs. So some theorists uh, argue that the whole reason for the complexity of African music is the lack of the easy drugs, the peyote, the you know, ayahuasca, the mushrooms, whatever, that didn't exist in, in Africa. I'd call that a hypothesis. It is a hypothesis, I don't know if but I'd it's call a very a interesting one. Okay, yeah. hypothesis. It, it I'm not sure how much evidence there, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Well, it's but certainly it's, circumstantial it's very evidence. poetic, yeah. but yeah. I'm not sure you could ever prove something like that unless you wanted to start your own yeah. civilization. Yeah. Well, in would in be contrast tough. to There's your that. daily sobriety, mm -hmm. I smoke weed from the minute I wake up until the minute I go to bed. I'm a writer, primarily, mm -hmm. and I do t I'm a television producer, but it has never affected me in a way. I'm not a lazy person, obviously. I'm like, <laughs> really super. I think in, in, in some ways it sort of turns my energy level a little bit mm -hmm. down so I can kind of deal with things. Mm. But, I, you know, I, I, from the, honestly, from the very first day that I smoked marijuana, the very first time I got high was like 14 or 15. I've pretty much smoked it every day since then, and I'm 46 now. Now, do you consider yourself addicted to marijuana? 
Because like you took your first toke at 14, you took your first drink at 14, you consider yourself an alcoholic, mm -hmm. you've been smoking ever since. Well, it's a much more benign How thing. I mean, what the thing, marijuana, you cannot strip paint with. It does not, you know, it's going to remove varnish or right, to destroy right. your organs inside. The toxicity, toxicity is, 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 is a totally different thing. I suspect Richard uses pot the way I use coffee. You know, I mean, as a, as a, as a, as as right. as yeah. yeah, it has but, a, both a ritualistic and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a therapeutic element to it that's right. life enhancing rather than you know life destroying. So, and so we can be addicted too, think, to so. to drugs, to chemicals, to experiences, whatever that aren't necessarily negative. You know, coffee is a habit. Tea right. is a habit. For right. me, marijuana is a habit. You know, it's it's. So if I you, do it habitually. But if you, well, I if you I, didn't get high, would it? Uh, would you get uptight? Would it bother you? And no, I don't think so. No, not really. Then would we call it an addiction, or is the well? That's what that's what I'm yeah, asking. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really part it's, of it's an addiction habitual. means that it's something that has negative effects on you. If you stop doing it, you miss it in a way that creates a lot of anxiety or, or problems. And while yeah. you're doing it, yeah. it is negatively yeah. impacting yeah. your existence. Absolutely, I think it has yeah. to meet both of those qualifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back to sex. Did you did you have a point there? <laughs> I, I uh, felt like I cut you off. No, I mean it, it's. I think that. Um, I mean, I think that the other, the other, just to move it in a slightly different direction, I mean, when you're young, you do a lot of drugs to lower your inhibitions in order right. to have sex. It's not just about the, 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 the Viagra that helps you when you're older get an erection. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's the kids at parties having a drink so that they can have, whether it's the courage to ask somebody out or the courage to take off your underwear, whatever else it is, you know, we use alcohol and especially alcohol, but other drugs as means to do things that we want to do, but we have an inhibition that's holding us back from doing it. Right. The question is, is that a, is that a good thing or not? And that's a certain type of drug. Right. Right, disinhibiting drug. Right. I, I wouldn't say acid No, uh, but, 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 you know, it, but if you're talking about what drugs young people are, and really all people are associating with sex, relatively few people are associating MDMA and LSD with sex compared to, say, alcohol. Yeah, right. well, yeah. relatively few yeah. people are taking M and, uh, exactly. MDMA and yeah. LSD compared to alcohol. Yeah, sure. So, but yeah, maybe this is, it, it's, it's a crutch. I mean, and you kept saying young people, young people. I know plenty of older people right, that exactly. do the same yeah, thing. Yeah, they can't even it. talk to somebody right. mm -hmm. in a social situation unless they have a few drinks in right. them. Cocktail party, yeah. you know, I mean, that's, cocktail parties are essential to a cocktail party. And, yeah. and I get that because when I go to a cocktail party, I, it's harder for me mm -hmm. to, to get to talking to people. Especially when you're walking around without a drink in your hand, and people you kind don't of look have a at Shirley you like Shirley Temple or something. I know, right? Sometimes yeah. I'll drink like a cranberry with a lime. So yeah, it looks it's like I'm drinking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what was made that was. smoking so great back when we could all smoke indoors. Uh, back in the day, yes, yeah, absolutely. yeah. Hands. Those I don't miss <laughs> those days. I gotta say. Mm. Uh, okay, no, one one other point about this. You know, you were you were sort of touching on this earlier, so to speak. That sex isn't about penile penetration necessarily, mm -hmm. right? So these drugs like MDMA that enhance a feeling of intimacy and compassion, even if it doesn't lead to actual sex, you were saying someone just touching your arm, mm -hmm. and you could have a very intimate situation with someone touching your arm that could... But you can also have that kind of situation with like a perfect stranger when you're on ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as he's perfect. <laughs> right. Well, I remember going what to about raves. An imperfect stranger? You know, you would go to raves and everybody would be rolling, and it would be like people you don't even know, and you're all just sitting really close together, and you're wearing fuzzy things, and there's blinky things, and it just, it doesn't really feel like an orgy. We used to actually call it a puddle, mm -hmm. where people just kind of all lie mm -hmm. on each other and touch each other, mm -hmm. and it wasn't really sexual in nature. Right. It was very. Oh, so so would you say I can't believe I'm intimate? admitting all of this on camera. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know. What are you well, doing to me? this out. Edit this right. part out. Um, but it was intimate, or at least yeah. it was. It was. Is was that, it really intimate though? Well, it was like that's fake my intimacy. Question. Is there such a thing as fake intimacy? If you feel it, is it real? But what happens when you wake up the next day and you go, "Oh my God, was that me? What did well, I say? I mean, if you what have an orgasm with a vibrator, that's a real orgasm, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not intimate. No, but I mean, I'm just saying in terms of definitions of experience, It's a real right? orgasm. So intimacy is an experience. If you experience it, whether it's chemically modulated or not, is it real? And this is, I think this is a huge philosophical question. It's kind of like love. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I thought I was in love at the time, and then I look back and I go, I don't think that was really love. Hmm. Well, I think like anything, the question is, is it, is it duplicable? 
with, without the chemical assistance. Yeah. You know, it, can you can you have intimacy without it? it so if you if you had sex with someone, amazing sex with someone, and you used ecstasy as a gateway to get close mm -hmm. to them, but then gradually you grew into a relationship where you could interact without that chemical assistance, then absolutely, right. all good. Right. But if, yeah. it, you, know, you know, intimacy presupposes, I think, philosophically, that you are connecting on a level of your, of your own identity unmediated by a drug. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 so it's I, gotta be natural at some right. point. Right. Well, e even if it doesn't start out that way, at some point right. you have to be just naked. And there's still going to be drugs. Sober there's still going to be dopamine. There's still going <laughs> no to be, you know, uh, well, that, oxytocin. Well, that's the other point. But there's yeah. a difference yeah. between the dopamine. I think there's a philosophical difference between the dopamine and the oxytocin in our brains. You guys yeah. are the scientists. Yeah. You know, I'm the gender studies guy. But between dopamine and MDMA, I really think that there is. In terms of one is very one, slight. Right. It's like one little. No, arm I mean of a philosophical molecule. difference. Oh, philosophical. Not not ah. not not a, not a chemical difference. One well. is one is a response that our body produces after we begin to experience something organic and natural. The other is the precondition for us experiencing something. In other words, yeah. you know, if 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 you're being yeah. touched by someone yeah. who loves you, yeah. and you're close to, and your brain releases dopamine. That's very different than you taking the drug and then random perfect stranger touching right, you but, and your brain giving right, you that Right, but what if you're experience. at a cinema and you're watching a film of two people touching each other and your brain releases dopamine? So that's a completely yeah. artificial experience that's great. And also, I think yeah. this is a risk of... Gotta wrap it up. Okay, okay but this is, this is a risk of, I think, uh, the way that we... Uh, communicate modern neuroscience. We don't know individual baseline levels of these neurochemicals at all. We have no way to measure them. So if, if one person's experience is, you know, an endogenous dopamine or serotonin experience. My serotonin experience is probably very different than yours, which is why I take an SSRI, you know, and so I may need exogenous enhancement of my endogenous neurochemicals to feel a baseline level that you experience without any external enhancement. And so we always love to normalize everybody and right. say that we have the same brain chemistry, but we don't. No, and, and, and even individuals' brain, brain chemistry changes constantly. And we can't which, measure it. Which is a very interesting point that um, Dennis McKenna made in a, in a documentary that you recommended on your, your site recently that I watched about the uh, hallucinogenic drugs. He said, you know, this whole debate about whether or not we should take drugs is ridiculous. We are drugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our brains and bodies are made of drugs. So, of course, we're all taking drugs all the time. Uh, with that point, we're going to cut away to a, a commercial and we'll come back and wrap it up. All right, welcome back. I'd like to uh, thank our panelists, Pasadena City College Professor Hugo Switzer, who just received a text from his wife asking him to pick up diapers on the way home. Is that correct? Uh, yes, nighttime diapers. Nighttime diapers. Uh, okay, I'm not going to ask who they're for. And uh, also the co-author of Beauty Disrupted, the autobiography of actress and supermodel Carrie Otis. Uh, we've got uh, also Dangerous Minds show host Richard Metzger. Thank you for your participation. And the Huffington Post science correspondent Cara Santa Maria, who brought her intelligence and cleavage to the show. <laughs> oh, thank God. you very much <laughs> for both. Uh, I'd also like to thank our point contributors, Dr. Julie Holland, author of Ecstasy, The Complete Guide, and Harry Shapiro, author of Waiting for the Man, The Story of Drugs and Popular Music. Also, thank you to the Levitra guy who threw the football through the tire. I'm Chris Ryan. Time. My book, not the first time, but he kept trying. Sex at Dawn, pick it up. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>